this past summer, I wanted to take my nine-year-old son with me to New York City. I really wanted to take him back to where I grew up. And I wanted to spend a significant amount of time there so he could really get to know the city that I love and the city that I came up in and, and the city that kind of made me. We stayed in Brooklyn and, and I lived in Brooklyn for a lot of years. And there were certain things that I did coming up that would inspire me. And one of those things was to walk across the Brooklyn Bridge. I would walk across the bridge and I would see the city and I would see the towers when they were there. And I would look at that and say, oh, human beings did this. And it would make me want to keep going, keep moving. So I wanted to walk across the bridge with my son. Then I got to this point on the bridge that I hadn't seen in a long time. And it was really the reason why I hadn't walked across the bridge in, in 18 years. It was the spot where I almost ended my life. I grabbed my son and my phone and I took a picture of that moment. The reason why I almost ended my life on the Brooklyn Bridge was because 20 years ago, I played Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars. I faced a media backlash that really made me feel like my life was over. I never thought it was a possibility to be in that movie. And I was doing a show called Stomp in New York, and I got lucky. The casting director for Star Wars was in the audience of one of the shows, and she asked me to audition, and I got it. And it was one of those magical things. It was one of those special things that happens that you don't really hear about. Next thing I knew, I was at Industrial Lights and Magic, and, and George Lucas was directing me for a screen test. I loved the work. And throughout my life, I've always wanted to be one of those actors that disappeared into roles. Jar Jar was that times 100 because I could literally disappear into Jar Jar. I, could, I was not there. And that to me was just the height of, of the art form. The thing that makes Jar Jar special from a lot of the other CGI characters that have happened since, ILM was writing the code for this as I was doing things. So the code that's being used now for CGI, I was a part of creating that. And on set, everybody was like, oh, this is gonna be great, this is amazing, and get ready to be a star and all that, and I believed it, you know? As a 24-year-old young actor, looking at your career and looking at your future, the, the best thing to feel is, all right, here we go. This is going to open the doors to so many different things and so many different opportunities. Then the movie came out. And there was just so much hate and venom and anger directed at me. And I took it personally. And a lot of times, you know, I hear people say, we're not talking about you, we're talking about Jar Jar. We're talking about me. I put a lot of me into that work. And if you talk to any artist and you talk to any artist who really cares about their work, you're talking about them. The hardest part for me in that entire situation was all of the criticism that came from uh, a racially motivated point of view. Growing up being black and wanting to be an artist, which is a very challenging and brave thing to do, it's not easy. We're always faced as black artists with this idea of being a sellout, right? We have our guard up when it comes to being portrayed as an Uncle Tom, a racial stereotype, or anything that makes you as a black person look less than. It hit me. It came right for me. I was called every racial stereotype you can imagine. It was just like 
criticism on being this Jamaican broken dialect, which was offensive because I'm of West Indian descent, I'm not Jamaican. It was debilitating. I didn't know how to respond. I was a 26 year old kid. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a manager. I didn't have a publicist. I didn't know anything about that. I was just alone. And the depression hit me hard. I was just broken. The only thing I could think of to make me feel better was to walk across the Brooklyn Bridge. But this time when I walked across the bridge, I didn't see the lights of Manhattan. I didn't see the towers. I didn't see the potential of hard work and ingenuity. I didn't see anything. I just saw a fog. I felt tired of having to explain myself. I felt tired of having to defend myself and defend my work. I felt tired of having to fight back against racism and the racial stereotype. I never, this is, I just wanted to play a part. I was exhausted, you know? So I walked across the steel girder between the walkway and the bridge. And I was standing at the other edge of the bridge and I was looking down at the East River and I had this thought. I remembered I went skydiving a year before. And as I was flying through the air skydiving, I remember having this thought. I remember if this chute doesn't open, I had a good life. Standing on the edge of the Brooklyn Bridge at that time, I had the same thought. I looked out at the East River and I looked out at the Statue of Liberty and I said, well, I had a good life. As I was standing there, a gust of wind just came by and it was really strong and knocked me off balance, right? And I caught myself. That's when I woke up, I caught myself. I thought to myself, if I was really about it, if I really wanted to do this, if I was really about that life, I would have let that gust of wind just take me. But I didn't. Life just came back to me. It just came rushing to me. Something in my consciousness that said, you, you have to make it to tomorrow. So I crawled across the, that steel girder separating the edge of the bridge from the walkway. And I was scared. <laughs> that's, when I, that's when I got scared. And I walked back to my apartment and I dealt with the next day. 20 years later, I'm on the bridge with my son and I'm looking at the spot. Just looking at it. And I take this picture. I don't know what to do with this picture. I just, I just look at it, you know? I don't know what to do with it. And I was really afraid to share this picture, you know? I was really scared because you put on this armor every day and you make it look like things don't affect you. I can't hide this anymore. This happened to me. Yeah, I felt this way. I took the picture of me and my boy and I put it on Twitter and all of a sudden it went everywhere and people were calling me and everybody started talking about it and it was surprising because I never really, uh, I never really thought anybody would care. We talk a lot about things going viral. And usually when things go viral, it's something negative. I didn't feel like what I posted went viral. I felt like it went communal. And I felt like it went communal because of the support. 
that I got that I never thought was there. And I'm glad I shared this moment because the response that I got back were from people that shared a similar moment. We're all here. We're all here now. And we made it through the next day because I shared that between me and my son. Um, I can get through 20 more years of next days. <laughs>